um, uh, at this moment we are actually launching uh, the edition online and uh, today uh, we have here, we have already uh, Ramada to the back and Pablo Dos Santos, people that have been closed, that are not very close to our report. And the event is basically structured um, in, in very, with very short presentations and obviously the yeah, questions that I'm asking. Uh, we also have Anwar Sheikh making introductory remarks. Anwar Sheikh, as we know, is the dean, is the, is the chair of the NSCR, uh, the, of the, is the chair of the New School Economic Department, and he really just published a book, Capitalism, Capitalism, Competition, and Crisis. And well, we have to go Anwar Sheikh. Uh, thank you, Jose, and thank you for, to all the people who set up this event and worked so hard to make this journal such a success. I mean, this is the eighth volume of a high quality journal put out by graduate students with a typical new school funding, which is basically done. <laughs> uh, so it's quite important. Today's event is about money, power, and capitalism. I want to also welcome Ramo Vasudeva, who is a graduate of our program, as well as now a professor, associate professor at Colorado State, and Pablo Dos Santos, who is a professor currently at our program in Salas originally. So these are connections that we treasure. And uh, I note also that in this edition of the journal, we have an article by a graduate student named Clara Matai, who is now going to be a faculty member next year. So we not only give people a chance to publish, we use it to recruit people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to make very brief remarks about the three themes here, which are money, power, and capitalism. Uh, in talking about money, it's, a, it's important to keep track of the historical rise of money, the manner in which it comes in bits and pieces, and it comes and disappears over time. And I think it's very important to talk about money not to confuse separation in time between payment and receipt and debt. Mm. Uh, anybody who goes to one of the big stores, Costco or something like that, you know you pay, uh, and sometimes you have the stuff there, but other times you pay first and then they bring it to you. So there's a separation between the payment and the receipt. And there are other situations that are just the opposite. In the old days, almost anybody in the middle classes could have something delivered to their house and the payment would be later. Now that is, in some formal sense, a uh, debt, but it's not really the sense of debt in which you borrow something, uh, money usually, and have to pay back. And so obligation shouldn't be confused with debt. In time of separation between payment and receipt shouldn't be confused with debt. Debt is something deeper. And then the third point in money is that modern fiat money has uh, very specific properties, very specific properties one of which is that it can be in principle printed without limit, so that the limit appears not in the printing, but in the effects. So it isn't that you abolish the limit, you displace the limit onto the consequences, and that's an important thing. Uh, power, typically when we talk about power, we talk about power of elites, we talk about power of the state, but we also talk about the power of the market, which is a very powerful institutional mechanism which produces outcomes that many people like and many people don't like. It is like a nuclear reactor. <laughs> it has uh, side effects. So, and the third is, is uh, capitalism. And here in capitalism, capitalism is much more than markets. Capitalism is the power of profit over almost all activities, including, by the way, the power of the state. Because the idea that the state can simply do anything is an idea that capitalism is a plastic and passive entity, but it is nothing like that. It's very strong and very willful in some important sense, and that raises the issue of the, both the effects of state activity and the limits of state So let me stop there and welcome our panelists. Well, thank you very much to uh, the editors uh, for the invitation, and thanks, Anwar, for the introduction. I got the invitation last week, it's rather short notice. I thought I'd throw that out there by way of disclaimer. Um, and then I heard that Rama was going to be speaking, 
And I thought, well, very cool. The worst that I could do was introduce her. Um, but since I seem incapable of saying anything in fewer than 15 or 20 minutes, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I thought, okay, I might as well use this opportunity to reopen a line of inquiry that has been dormant uh, for some time. A line of inquiry that I've been pursuing on the constitution, content, and contradictions of contemporary monetary forms. I thought that would be an apt um, topic given that I will be speaking next to, to Rama. This is very much work in progress and I don't even have a, a preliminary product. In fact, by and large what I'll be talking about today, the things that I'll be putting forward are interpretative and, and foundational. There are no great results. Arguably there are no results either. Um, but there are a number of interesting interpretations and observations that may prove useful as we try to under characterize and understand contemporary monetary um, I'll mainly be setting up the stage for it. Now, this issue of contemporary monetary forms is important because we know money matters. And specifically, to my mind today, world money uh, matters. We have a very peculiar system of international settlements centered on the currency of a particular state. And that creates some pretty significant asymmetries in the system and to a significant extent has helped condition the current pattern of accumulation that we have, um, the pattern of accumulation that we have been experiencing. The rapid industrialization of some countries with the converse rapid deindustrialization of other economies, centrally the United States. <clears throat> this issue is also interesting because to my mind it is largely unsettled, um, theoretically. Contemporary money certainly involves credit uh, monetary systems that are state managed and are based, based on state backed liabilities. Marxian con contributions, with some important exceptions, um, have not really dealt with the creditor-debtor nature and state-centeredness of the contemporary monetary system. Um, on the other hand, the, the other contenders for, for uh, explanation, charterless and nominalists, have done very little except pointing to the state-centeredness and creditor-debtor relations as the foundation of money. So we're left with a little bit of an analytical arbitrage opportunity, if you will, to my mind. In the way that I've been thinking about this, I am very much grounding myself and trying to build upon the contribution of my former supervisor um, and, and colleague, Kosas Lepovitsis, specifically on his, uh, his characterization of moneyness, what the most general feature of moneyness is, and his um, contribution on the structure of capitalist credit systems, which means that I am indirectly basing myself on the UNO school of Japanese Marxism, uh, which greatly influenced um, uh, Kosas in his development. More immediately, I think that the intervention that this contribution makes is the debates between Jeff Ingham and Costas on the nature or the ontology of money, a debate that I have found both interesting and largely inconclusive in no small part because, like many academic debates, it suffered from a lack of analytical empathy by the players in relation to the positions of, of each other. So you have passing ships at night a little bit. And I think we can actually distill something that takes the, uh, the best of both contributions in, in an interesting way. Again, at this stage, very interpretational, not very conclusive. From Costas, what I have taken is the idea that at the most general level, money is the monopolist of the ability to buy. And it must be under, you can understand Marx's contribution in the first volume of Capital as an exposition that it in effect says that this ability to buy is defined in markets by the actions of all commodities that are seeking an expression for their exchange value on the body of the monetary commodity. Moneyness, hence, is something that is consistent, that regularly tested in markets by the actions of commodities that are held, owned, by competitive capitalist players that are looking for a quantitative measure of social sanction, if you will, for their pri private productive efforts on the body of the monetary commodity. That's quite a mouthful. So if we want to investigate what the source of the moneyness or, or how, why it is that any given monetary form functions as a money, we need in the first instance to have a characterization of the origins of its ability to buy. If it cannot do that, it's really not going to be a very suitable uh, uh, monetary form. On top of this, we need also, of course, to characterize the basis for its value. Now, the ability to buy does something very interesting because it gives the holder of money a fairly immediate market command over social labor, whether that social labor is in the form of labor power or of other commodities. There's a related and very important point that was advanced most um, prominently recently by uh, Haubrunner, 
which is that this command over social labor gives money or renders money into a very peculiar thing. It renders money, turns money into the quintessentially capitalist form of social power. The capitalist social power is not based on ownership of estates. It's not based on control over armies. It is actually based uh, on most regular situations on possession of this thing called money. It allows you to get people to do things for you. It allows you to appropriate the uh, product of the labor of others and so on. But there's a difficulty because money is spent. So that in the exercise of capitalist social power, you uh, no longer have <laughs> capitalist social power. Against this perspective, we can very much understand the circuit of capital as an attempt to reproduce and expand quantitatively that social power that capital and monetary form um, has. This, of course, means that if the circuit of capital is the organizing principle uh, in the functioning of a capitalist economy, it would be an analytical mistake to put too much of a division between the functioning of money in exchange and the functioning of money as a store of wealth because the circuit of capital is very much trying to expand money as a form of wealth. How, how am I doing for time? I uh, just spoke for seven minutes. Oh, very good. Okay. Now, I'm also trying to engage meaningfully with the main contributions that colleagues working on nominalist and charterless um, basis um, have made. They have usefully pointed to the fact that yes, Contemporary capitalist money is uh, significantly based on creditor-debtor relations. And the state plays a big role in the management and running of contemporary monetary systems. The problem is that, as far as I can see it, these contributions, while pointing correctly to these realities of contemporary monetary systems, have not uh, <coughs> considered the distinctive manner in which states play a role in contemporary monetary systems and the distinctive types of creditor-debtor relations that constitute contemporary monetary forms. Um, it's a little bit, uh, and there's something that kind of irks me, and I know it irks other colleagues uh, uh, in here in some of these contributions when people get up and simply say, well, money is simple. Money is whatever the state says money is. Money is simple. Money is just a creditor-debtor relation like it has, uh, has always been. Look, you can look at these... Uh, uh, clay tablets in cuneiform from Mesopotamia from 3,000 years ago, and there you have it, the state running the monetary system. Now, it goes without saying that you cannot deny the fact that these tablets existed and there was some form of uh, socioeconomic coordination taking place uh, in them. But to attempt to comprehend contemporary monetary phenomena on that basis is to miss, among other things, the very specificity of the way in which states engage with monetary systems today and the very specificity with which the credit monetary form has come to be the defining monetary form of capitalism. It's a little bit like saying that I'm going to try and understand the human brain by looking at the brain of a squirrel. There are going to be many, many similarities and you're going to understand quite a bit. But that which makes our brain distinctive and, and fundamentally human does not lie in, its, in the intersection between its structure and functioning with the brain of a squirrel, to put it very prosaically. So, uh, I don't like, while these contributions have pointed to important characteristics and, and foundational aspects of contemporary money, they are ahistorical. And they are also um, uh, missing uh, a number of distinctive important points of contemporary monetary systems. The other thing is, or another way of putting this problem is, is as follows. Um, if money was so simple, why do we have so much monetary instability? Why do we, when we read the history of, of economic debates and, and, and economic thought, you basically have the economists responding to the latest crisis, which invariably has some monetary component. The birth of monetary theory and debates about monetary policy, 1797, <coughs> unfavorable exchanges. Britain is running a, a trade deficit. You have the, the counter-revolutionary wars against France. They don't know how the system works. If the charterless were right, you know, the, the king could have gotten up and said, enough, problem solved. And in many ways, I'll, I'll, actually I'll get to the, to the historical argument that I'm trying to make um, in a second. I need to make a slightly broader point first, which is this. In light of the fact, or based on the understanding that I take from the interpretation that, that Cost has developed of the most general uh, content of moneyness, 
and of my recognition that uh, creditor-debtor relations are important. The role of the state in the constitution of contemporary money is important. What I have been trying to do is to establish how contemporary monetary, monetary systems develop and how they come to generate things that can function as money. Things that have consistent ability to buy and that can act as stores of wealth. That to me is a question, it's not an answer. In thinking about this, we need to think about how capitalist accumulation propelled the development of capitalist monetary systems and how the, the credit monetary forms that those systems were issuing came to possess ability to buy and the ability to act as stores of wealth. Now, historically, my sense is that capitalism inherits a particular type of monetary system from previous modes of production. It inherits a monetary system that, that is based on commodity forms of money. It's based on the circulation of actual metallic coins and systems that where states um, gave themselves the monopoly over the power of men, gave them some power of seniorage and all sorts of interesting things. From a sufficiently broad perspective, it seems to me that capitalism increasingly found those monetary systems inadequate for its needs. If capitalism is a system that intrinsically grows, you have to reckon with the following fact that I first became aware of on the basis of the circuit of capital framework of, of uh, Duncan Foley. For any given state of liquidity preferences and broader portfolio preferences, if you are going to have growth, you need monetary expansion. Hmm? You need to feed the portfolios that are going to make agents willing to engage in the, higher, the greater scales of reproduction that they want to engage in. Fine. The problem is that a commodity monetary system is not sufficiently flexible to supply those growing uh, uh, stocks of money. Somebody on Twitter or something? Is that oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> this is way too much social media for my... Uh... Now, this inadequacy or inflexibility, uh, and there are other manifestations of, of the inflexibility that I won't get into right now, um, can be understood to express, have expressed itself in the systematic development of investment opportunities for capitalists who would have insufficient money to undertake them. And as good capitalists facing a profitable opportunity, but without the monetary means to mobilize the resources that they would like to mobilize to engage in these opportunities, they would be willing to part with some of the proceeds from uh, these projects if somebody could produce such means. If somebody could give them something that would allow them to go to markets and mobilize the resources that it would allow them to invest so that they could produce. Where was Most fundamentally, uh, this appetite to invest beyond the particular possession of money of any individual capitalist drove the development of credit monetary systems, drove the development of new institutions, new practices, new instruments. And, and you see this uh, very early on from the mid 18th century, if not earlier. And inevitably, the development of new practices, new institutions, and, and new instruments would lead to crises, would lead to instabilities, and then would lead to debates, controversies, theorizations about the functioning of the system. And we can think of this process as an evolutionary process where little by little, capitalist polities learn about the functioning of their uh, monetary systems. This is not a linear relationship. Ideology plays a big role in, in all of this. You can move backwards. But um, lessons were learned along the way. Now logically, the system that evolved with the capacity to give capital the kind of flexibility, the monetary flexibility that it needs, ultimately consisted uh, or had at its heart creditor-debtor relations. Basically the idea that you have a monetary system that is um, the consequence of the emission of liabilities, ex nihilo, that permit the issuer to acquire assets. Now sociologists, nominalists, and, and, and other uh, colleagues in effect state that then the equality between the quantity of liabilities that is created and the measure of the assets that those, excuse me, that the emission of those liabilities creates or acquires, that is sufficient to ensure the circulation of monetary liabilities. Because the bank is creating an equal amount of a claim on society as 
the claim that society has on the bank that is sufficient to ensure that willy-nilly the liability of the bank will circulate all over uh, the economy. I think not without great difficulty it can be shown that this is not quite true. It is only true in a very, very abstract conceptualization of the process of emission, production, and reflux. The moment that you start thinking about these things dynamically, you realize that actually accumulation ensures a number of things. One of them, of course, is the accumulation of banking capital out of interest rate differentials. I'm not very interested in that for present purposes. But you have accumulation of net claims on the issuer by capitalists who realize a profit. And I'll characterize that um, uh, in a second. I'm going to skip this. Um, in, in the explanation that, I, that I've been working on uh, for all of this, I've based myself on the schematization of, of the structure of the credit system that, that Kostas Lepovitz has put together. And um, what I've been adding to that is the question of the basis for the ability to buy of different liabilities at different um, uh, levels of, of the system. What is the basis for the ability to buy of a promissory note? What is the basis for the ability to buy of a bank, uh, the, the liability of a single bank? What is the basis for the ability to buy of a central bank note? And I'll, and I'll give you the punchlines in, in, uh, within a couple of minutes. The basic idea here, and in, in this I'm taking seriously the claim of the sociologist, is that an agent who has a debt obligation will be willing to accept in exchange for his or her goods something that allows them to discharge that obligation. If you cannot meet an obligation, you go bankrupt. Bad things happen to you. If your obligation is to the mafia, very bad things happen to you. If your obligation is to your bank and this relates to your house, you'll be evicted, you'll lose your house, and so on. So it is safe to assume that the sociologists have a point, that people will accept in payment for their commodities <coughs> things that allow them to discharge any obligations that they may have. The moment you start looking at the structure of the credit system, and that, of course, then becomes the foundation for the ability to buy of certain things. In other words, the indebtedness of agents does create some measure of ability to buy for the things that allow those agents to cancel those debts. Yeah? So a promissory note, for example, basically an IOU. I issue it to, to a, su a supplier of mine, and they hold it. Uh, in, in lieu of payment in three months, there's an implicit interest payment in there. People broadly know uh, how this works. The sphere of circulation for that promissory note is very limited. In fact, the only person who will unconditionally accept my promissory note in payment for, for goods is me. <coughs> right? Because it allows me to discharge an obligation against the rest of society that is symbolized by that particular note. And you can generalize this and consider a bank. And here things become a little bit more interesting because the moment you have a bank that is actually engaging in lending to many, many people, you have the development of what some sociologists have called a payments community, or we can call it a settlement network. Right? As I am advancing lo loans ex nihilo to acquire claims on you, you are transacting, we are part of a community, you are by and large transacting within my balance sheet, which gives me a certain float, my liabilities will, will, will have a certain um, circulation. In this setting, since there are obligations to me as your bank throughout the economy, there will be a fairly widespread acceptance of my own liabilities in payment for goods and services. Because you, different people in this community need to come back to me and pay. And in many ways, as capitalism was trying to uh, come out of the straitjacket of the monetary system that it inherited, this starts to happen. Banking grew out of uh, goldsmiths and money storage services on the one hand, and on the other hand, out of the discounting of promissory notes. Now, there is a problem that every settlement network is going to face. Because we are not the world economy. We're not even the national economy in the first instance, if we are a country bank. Right? We are just a subset. And all of us are, more likely than not, unless we're North Korea, actually even North Korea trades with the rest of the world. Uh, we are trading with the rest of the world. Right? 
And you can schematize this in a, in a very simplified way, logically, as we have our own settlement system here, and then the next village has a settlement system, and we do trade. And we should expect there to be trade surpluses and trade deficits. And that poses a tricky question, because there is absolutely no reason, a priori, for agents in the next village to accept our money in exchange for goods and services, because there is no obligations, there, there are no obligations for us, a priori, over there. And if we're running a deficit against the, uh, the next uh, village, there, is, there are going to be, uh, as, the, um, as was termed in the um, late um, 18th century, unfavorable exchanges. Right? Basically, there is going to be an oversupply of, uh, of my liabilities as the bank of our settlement network in relation to the willingness to hold our money. So people are going to be fleeing to other forms of stores of wealth. But there's a deeper problem. Even if we think like Ricardo, that trade tends to balance eventually. And I, mean, I shouldn't even introduce the price PG flow mechanism. But let, let's suppose that trade, is not, that trade deficits are not chronic. And one day's gain is enough for <coughs> loss, and everything is good in the long run. We have the accumulation of net claims against me in our own settlement network. And this is something that you can only appreciate dynamically. The moment you actually start tracking the evolution of stocks in the economy as, a port, as opposed to a pure flow uh, consideration of emission production reflux, sale reflux. If I make a loan to an agent uh, in our settlement network, um, her assets, her, her net worth changes by zero. Why? Because you are incurring now a debt to me, but you're also purchasing assets in equal measure. My net worth doesn't change as a bank because I have issued liabilities in equal measure to the assets that I have acquired. Dynamically, I will make profit because there will be interest rate differentials and I will accumulate uh, uh, banking capital, but that's, uh, at, at this level of abstraction, a second order thing. But something else happens because the borrower is using the loan to buy goods and services from somebody else. If that somebody else is realizing a profit, over and above any interest that they may have to pay me, they realize profit of enterprise, which can be capitalized. Which means that even though the total stock of money out there in the economy is equal to the stock of claims I have on the economy as a bank, there are positions in the economy that have a net claim against me. And if people in the economy have a net claim against the, uh, the issuer of the settlement network, the settlement network needs to induce them to hold those balances. And that's when things become interesting, right? Because there is no guarantee that people will hold your liabilities. I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Um, banks need to ensure the circulation of their liability as, uh, as stores of wealth or as monetary expressions of capital value. Um, it needs to be understood that this will fundamentally constrain the behavior of individual banks. And as you think about the logical um, development of banking systems, it also pushes banks to engage with other banks and borrow and lend from other banks. At, any, at the end of any given day, you may have a particular shortage of reserves. Um, you go to the next bank and you borrow from them. The moment that you have banks borrowing from banks and lending to <coughs> banks, you see a very significant expansion of the settlement network that they now jointly define. Because agents will then according to the very simple principles that we started from, be willing to accept liabilities of both banks hmm, as means of payment because they, they are going to be either themselves indebted to a bank or indebted to somebody that is indebted to um, one of the two banks. And broadly speaking, and I'm going here now to the area where, where um, Rama works. In line with this view, we can understand central banking as a spontaneously emerging institution of the interbank market. Once you have an interbank market and banks lending to banks, there are, there are network effects that will ensure that a particular bank will tend to dominate the interbank market. Why is that? Because actually the more borrowers I have, if I am a money market player, the more demand for loans I will face. Because the more borrowers I have, the more widespread is the basis for the function of my money as something that has ability to pay. So people who are actually wanting to transact with the economy are more likely to come to me and demand my liabilities. The central bank thus develops within the, the, the capitalist money market, competitively, 
right, as part of these efforts to broaden the scope of circulation of the liabilities of the credit systems. All of this is prior to the state engagement with the, with the Central Monetary Authority and the designation of the liabilities of the Central Bank as legal tender. And it's important to understand that. That central banking is not born out of the state, it's actually born out of the market and can be understood as, as the evolutionary consequence of attempts to supply capital with a sufficiently flexible uh, uh, monetary form. And I'll conclude just with an observation. I told you there were no great big conclusions here, just a bunch of um, observations, uh, which is the following. If you're following the thread of this account, you're going to realize two things. The first one is that <clears throat> the settlement network that a central bank defines faces the same problems that the original settlement network faced, i.e., it faces potential balance of payments problems. But here you realize something, that the balance of payments issues are not in, in it of themselves a problem of national economies. They're actually problems of settlement networks. It just so happens that the development of credit monetary systems has stopped because of the national limits of capitalist political economies. This leads me to the final point, which is it allows us then to think about the current absence of a well-functioning system of international settlement, not only as something that is iniquitous and does all sorts of, of horrendous things, and, 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 and you know, reserve accumulation and all sorts of um, unfavorable things for countries in the periphery, but also as an expression of monetary underdevelopment. That actually, in attempting to broaden mm, the, 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 the flexibility of the monetary system, you would think that the system would want to throw up a settlement network that was operating in the same scopes as the scopes within which um, production, exchange, and, and finance is engaged in, i.e. internationally. But the system is not able to do so. Be because at, at, at this level you are dealing with um, national capitalist uh, nation states. Um, so I'll just stop there. There's a lot more. I had about twice as long that I could talk for, but uh, I'll finish. I think I've done about 26 minutes or something like that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in New School and it's a real honor to be here at the launch of the eighth issue of the NSCR. Um, so uh, I've had this long, long standard interest in understanding and uh, engaging with the notion of imperialism and Anwar will vouch for that because I used to pester him with, with my ramblings about this from the point I entered New School. But um, I was uh, brought up on the notion of monopoly capitalism and once Anwar pulled the rug out from under that conception, I was searching for other ways to understand. And that kind of brought me to the political economy of money and finance. And kind of long conversations with Duncan have been really, really instrumental in helping me wade through this, uh, this area. If I'm still not swimming, it's not your fault. <laughs> But anyway, so um, uh, I mean, it's the usual disclaimer. So, um, it's interesting. If, if Paula and me had uh, planned it, I don't think we could have kind of uh, uh, had this complimentary presentation. Uh, in, a, in a better way. It was, per it was perfect to have that uh, b before because, um, I mean, part of the story of money, power, and capitalism is the fact that uh, money and finance are not simply functional capital, but m it is deeply embedded in the structure of capitalist relations. Now, uh, Marx had this very layered conception or a theory of money, and he, uh, going through the stages of exchange, circulation, and accumulation. And uh, there's a logical and historical structure to this analysis. Now, in this context, I mean, one has to see uh, the role of money as a means of payment in this context of this logical historical structure. But one, I mean, and the, the money as a means of payment is, is kind of at the heart of the movement from money to credit system. Right? So
So, um, but but if you're looking at uh, the role of money of, uh, I mean, one of the significance of the role of money as a means of payment is also that exchange relations are now transformed into debt relations, a creditor-debtor relation. And what this means is that in the end, that uh, settlement system is, uh, is, a, is basically a structured hierarchy of claims, right? And um, so that when we say money is not neutral, among the things we also mean <coughs> is that money has a role in establishing social relations between capital and labor. And you can see that in the use of inflation targeting to protect profits and surplus between finance and industry, uh, for instance, in the way monetary policy is used to um, uh, uh, boost finance, and also between nation states. And um, the, 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 I mean, what one is trying to do is understand a um, monetary system which is based on the liability of a state, of, on the monetary liability of a state. Uh, but as Paolo kind of also kind of set the stage for, uh, you cannot do this without understanding one, the monetary roots of credit, and two, um, mon money's role as a financial asset. It is, I mean, it's, uh, it is here, it's not just token, it's not just fiat, it's a financial asset. And uh, um, because of the fin it's a financial asset, you also have to understand the private mechanisms for generating liquidity, which in a sense precede the, the state credit standard. So um, we're dealing neither with a commodity standard nor with a fiat standard, but what we're trying to see is a, is a kind of understand the process of uh, evolution. I mean, there's one story which goes from commodity money to token money to fiat. But we also have to understand it in the context of the movement from commodity money to these private mechanisms of generating liquidity to the role of the state in managing these, uh, managing these mechanisms. So as um, liquidity generation got delinked from gold and bullion, it got embedded in the processes of mechanisms of managing public debt in particular. And that process is the heart of understanding uh, both the emergence and the functioning of a state credit standard. So which takes us to the political economy of debt. And there are two kind of, I mean, when in a, a, a Marx has two way, I mean, uh, has, has two kind of frameworks or two ways in which he understands public debt. The first is uh, public debt as uh, in the context of his discussion of fictitious capital. So as a tradable asset, it represents uh, basically claims on future revenues, here tax, and its valuation is again based on capitalization of these future revenues. And so, unlike what uh, uh, Costa La Pavista says, treat, treats, um, uh, I mean, uh, this standard as valueless tender, as the dollar as valueless tender, it does have a value, but this value depends on the actions of investors, the movement of interest rate, and other macroeconomic factors. Okay? At the same time, it generates these parallel circuits of, uh, and these growing circuits of financial transactions. So, uh, and, I mean, so what we have is basically um, um, a monetary system where you, you have, where the, uh, where, uh, which is ultimately based on a, a system of valuation which is akin to that of fictitious capital. The second is the notion of, I mean, the role of public debt as a lever of public, of uh, uh, primitive accumulation. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Marx, of course, talks about uh, public debt as a claim on future tax revenues and how, uh, how it becomes through taxes a way of expropriating workers in the future. But, uh, and we can see a link between that and public debt and austerity. Uh, policies in the contemporary context, but uh, even apart from that, what 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 uh, public debt represents is a transfer, uh, both creation and transfer of wealth, because you can't have public debt without private finance, and uh, the growth of public debt fosters the growth of private finance, and it fosters the growth of the stock uh, the stock exchange, gambling, and what Marx calls the modern bankocracy, and this whole reign of uh, financial speculators and even the international credit system. Now, in a sense, um, there's, a, there's a deep connection between 
let's say, war financing and the, and the growth of uh, the financial markets. For instance, the, the difference between what happened in France during the Napoleon, uh, Napoleonic Wars and England, which financed its the war, Napoleonic War effort through uh, bonds. Right, and so uh, I mean, uh, public debt rise to two and a half times GDP, and saw a huge surge in the bond, uh, in the private bond market. In fact, Rothschild made his one of his fir his first millions through speculating on war bonds during the Napoleonic Wars. Right, so there is a connection. <coughs> So, so these are the two, I mean, I think uh, uh, when we are thinking of the state of credit standard and a standard based on liability of a state, uh, the, these two kind of conceptions, one of fictitious capital, two of its role in prim as a lever of primitive uh, accumulation are important. So now let's, uh, I mean, um, so uh, Paolo's uh, kind of uh, framework, uh, um, let's see it in, in, I mean, in historical and institutional uh, context. And let's, I mean, to begin with, I'd like to kind of uh, go to the 19th century. And even, I mean, it, it was a gold standard, but you had these like uh, 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 kind of these mechanisms of liquidity generation, which were far beyond what the Peel Act or the gold reserves of the Bank of England would allow for. And this was through the market and this growing burgeoning market for bills, right? And the mechanism was such that you had, I mean, uh, I mean, especially in the second half of the 19th century, you had this uh, huge, um, um, I mean, growth of joint stock banks, which are mobilizing <coughs> deposits. Now, uh, the discount houses which were brokering uh, the bill trade could draw on the joint stock banks either through call loans, which are short-term loans, which were callable, uh, or through some kind of uh, advances against, uh, which were like a repo transactions against the bills they had in, the, in their balance sheet. And this was used to finance a huge growth of bills. Now, these bills, and, uh, which, was, which were traded on and created a tremendous amount of liquidity, which was, which, um, was not just li uh, limited to, to the, the boundaries of England, but international. So this mechanism of uh, uh, liquidity generation was very important in taking the, I mean, uh, generating liquidity without, I mean, beyond the limits of the uh, gold reserves. Now the the, count, the de facto counterparty to the uh, to this private mechanism was the Bank of England. Right, which which had a dual mandate. On one hand, it was uh, it had to it, ha it had to kind of uh, protect its profits and uh, the interests of its shareholders, uh, of his brother. Uh, but it also had to um, it, I mean, it also had uh, basically it also had to preserve the reserves. I mean, uh, make sure that uh, it could maintain uh, the exchange rate. Right, and protects the reserves. Now, um, when the bill market would collapse, uh, the discount, I mean, the Bank of England was your last line of defense, right? But especially, uh, I mean, in the second half of the 19th century, the tensions between the Bank of England and the discount houses was growing because on one hand, you had this huge trade in bills and you had a bank which was increasingly unable to calibrate flows because its, uh, um, I mean, its intervention in the markets was dwarfed by that of these private, uh, I mean, uh, discount houses, right? So, so it was reserved, I mean, it's, it's reserves of gold and its dual mandate in some sense constrained its ability to act and yet it was uh, it was also seeing uh, a joint, uh, discount houses free ride on their ability to go back to the Bank of England as a last line of defense so in uh, 1858 it stops discounting bills right now the uh, so what, what we're seeing here is a process of contestation where the state is trying to I mean is not able to the Bank of England, which was still private at that point, is, is not able to manage this, this uh, unregulated mechanism of liquidity generation in the, in the, bill, in the bill markets. And, what, and the Barings crisis in 1890s, which was set off by uh, loans made by the Barings Bank in England to Argentina, which once they collapsed, the Barings was under threat, and that would have affected the entire city of London. So, 
at this point of time, you had, uh, uh, I mean, very dramatic interventions. And I mean, you, you, you had these parlays with financiers, the, the head of the treasury, the head of the Bank of England, and it kind of, you see, I mean, um, it, it's uh, very much like the meeting of 13 bankers. Uh, around the, the crash of Lehman. You had similar parlays between uh, the Treasury, the Bank of England, and um, um, the financiers like Rothschild uh, in, a, in, a way, in an attempt to prevent the system from collapsing. And what happens at this point is that the Bank of England is also learning how to manage this market, how to intervene in this market, how to cope with a market <coughs> where, where there's a vast swath of unregulated liquidity. Right, so so one thing it does is widens this window, allows bills of, la of a larger and larger duration to be accepted in, uh, for rediscounting. This is also the time when it's begun to use the Treasury bill, which was uh, introduced, I think, sometime in the 1870s, um, 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 on the on the recommendation of uh, Bagehot. It finally used it as collateral when trying to get uh, uh, get uh, get money from France. It also, uh, after the Bering's crisis, began to use the Treasury bill as a substitute. So there's a public uh, uh, money market instrument as a substitute for the private bills in the money market. So it's created an uh, uh, instrument to directly intervene in the money market. It also drew on sterling balances and gold reserves from other countries, and which brings us to the international dimension. And what, I mean, I, uh, what happens in the Bering crisis is a crucial stage in uh, the evolution of the mechanisms of a state credit standard. And this standard has one, a, both a public-private dimension, public fin uh, I mean, public debt and private finance, and that's the same mechanism we talked about of generating sterling liquidity through the bill market, and which is uh, ultimately backstopped by the Bank of England. Right. So when that market collapsed, uh, it, I mean, the, that market was supported by the belief that the Bank of England is the ultimate guarantor, and the Bank of England now begins to uh, kind of uh, intervene in the form by using treasury bills, and also in, in, instead of private bills. But behind the ability of the Bank of England to kind of um, to intervene is its ability, its its special position uh, in the international context. Right. So on one hand, it can draw on France and Germany, but but it can equally draw on the sterling balances of Japan and uh, India. Uh, so that those sterling balances are where, where I mean uh, are where its liabilities are being created, and then uh, it it also extends debt uh, and credit through bonds and other instruments to debtor countries, including in Latin America. And so this triangular adjustment, so the intermediation uh, um, uh, pattern, which I, which I just talked about, has another layer, which is these triangular adjustments in the international sphere. So you have this connection between public, private, national, international, and the whole working of this standard. So now, um, now it, um, so um, hopefully this is not a comparison between the brain of a squirrel and the brain of a human, but the um, but the the functionings of the market in uh, during the gold standard period with uh, under the Bank of England's kind of hegemony, uh, it it help it has some insights for understanding the contemporary. Well, I mean, the contemporary monetary system, in particular, with this large growth of the shadow economy in the uh, uh, and uh, this pri what what um, could be called the private dollar system. I mean, uh, Merling has this uh, kind of uh, uh, a very insightful characterization of the hybrid hierarchical nature of money, right? So, so what you have in the private dollar system is you have mobilization. So, um, uh, and this is the counterpart to the mechanisms of the bill markets I was talking about. So you have on one hand you, the money market uh, funds which mobilize savings. Um, uh, the broker dealers who are, secure, who are issuing securitized loan assets, they, I mean, and, um, they are basically using, um, I mean, uh, using commercial paper including asset-backed commercial paper and repo transactions on these 
in order to uh, generate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the securitized products which are then being sold. So this shadow economy is in some senses another mechanism of private liquidity generation. Right. And it has obviously since the, especially the 90s and 2000s, grown at a tremendous pace. Now again, in parallel, you, one would see that um, for the system, I mean, the US Treasury bill and the public dollar is at the apex of the credit system. So ultimately, uh, the backstop again goes back to the uh, Federal Reserve. But what you've had since the 90s is the growth. I mean, so unlike, um, uh, I mean, the period I was talking about where the Treasury bill, the British Treasury bill is inserted into the money market uh, as a short-term instrument, which is alternative to the private money market instruments. Now what you have is, I mean, the creation of a whole range of short-term instruments which are acceptable. Uh, 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 as collateral uh, in the repo market, and which were uh, which were basically, um, which were in some senses uh, playing a larger and larger role compared to the U.S. Treasury bill in this period, right? So this um, parallel unregulated mechanism of creation of credit and liquidity through the, sh the shadow banking system is kind of. Um, what we're dealing with, but at the apex of this again is the public dollar. And that becomes clear after the crisis. And after the crisis, the Fed steps into the breach and expands its balance sheet. And it basically takes on a whole range of, um, uh, ac begins to accept a whole range of asset backed securities as part of its um, balance, uh, balance sheet. So, this, I mean, so. Um, I mean, there are parallels between the QE um, policy and uh, what happened by, uh, with the Bank of England after the Bayrex crisis. But equally important is that the, uh, the global surge in the market for US, US Treasury bills, the tremendous expansion in this, was enabled by the demand for Treasury bills internationally. So you have, again, a national international dimension. And you have the same kind of thing, and this in a sense is, so you have, um, uh, you, you, you have uh, credit creation on the basis of um, uh, the US Treasury bill, but it is, it has this tremendous uh, parallel private mechanisms associated <coughs> with it. But ultimately, the, I mean, the, uh, uh, this private unregulated mechanism has its un uh, ultimate backstop, the US Fed. But for the US Fed to play its role and its ability to be the backstop also depends on, the, on its role in, these tra in uh, global uh, adjustment patterns. And here, I mean, earlier it was Japan, but now uh, of late, uh, China is the biggest uh, source. So you have its ability, I mean, the uh, dollar reserves in central banks in China and, and other uh, emerging markets too, uh, uh, kind of underwrite the liabilities of the US state. And you have the same process of exporting fragility to debtor markets or to the weakest kind of, I mean, to, uh, and, and so you see that there's public-private, there's domestic, international, and you see very much uh, um, the same patterns happening over here. Now, one difference between the bill and um, the, the securitized products of this period is that the bill was count had to be countersigned, and so ultimately, um, uh, when the bill had to be paid, it's either uh, uh, the acceptor or the countersigner who has to, who has to pay. And the sign of the countersigner and, and of the accepting bank is is what attests to the creditworthiness. In in the in the in the contemporary system, you have uh, the credit trading agencies, which give you the imprimatur of being. Uh, clo I mean, uh, uh, investment grade, and you have, um, you can draw kind of insurance in the form of credit default swaps. So the pers I mean, so the broker dealers who are creating these instruments are in some senses are not the ultimate, uh, ultimately liable to pay when uh, when the house of cards comes falling down. But so uh, in the I mean, uh, I talked about the uh, I mean. 
so what we have is a system of um, um, based on, li uh, on, the, on, the, on the monetary liability of a key currency country. But an uh, important part of this is that all public debt is not equal. And the public debt of the key currency country is privileged over the public debt of the other countries. And you can see the use of debt as an instrument of shaping and reshaping international relations continuously. Now, during the uh, in the 1880s, when uh, Egypt had defaulted with uh, a bond loan uh, bond, uh, uh, to its bondholders uh, in the city of London, you had um, a, mil uh, a military exercise, and the Khedive Treasury was taken over. After the Bearings Crisis, you had um, uh, a consortium uh, under the head of uh, a headship of Rothschild, which basically kind of structured policies for Argentina to ensure repayment of those bonds. Okay. Um, we don't need, uh, I mean, so by that time, gunboat diplomacy was not needed, but there is still uh, mechanisms to ensure debt repayment, which fall asymmetrically on uh, developing countries. And we see that again in the uh, IMF brokered uh, bailouts after the uh, uh, debt crisis in the 80s or the currency crisis in the 90s. And we also see this in uh, the entire imbroglio over Argentina's sovereign debt default, right, which has been dragging on for about 14 years now and has been held hostage by, 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 by Walter Funds, basically. So debt is, an, I mean, so this privileges are denominated in uh, uh, the key currency. And this, in a sense, is my story. Because the state credit standard ultimately depends on the ability of the central bank of the key currency country to calibrate capital inflows and outflows and without eroding the confidence in its credit worthiness. And this ability hinges on its ability to, ma to manage public debt, the market for its public debt. And that, in a sense, is why that, I mean, um, uh, the difference between the key currency country and, let's say, emerging market. Uh, uh, the, the, um, and and what's, the management of its public debt also depends on its management of these parallel financial mechanisms and the depth and liquidity of these parallel financial uh, mechanisms. But this management also, in some senses, holds the state <coughs> hostage. Because every time there's a collapse, every time there's a crisis, and um, the central bank has to step in, uh, the stakes go higher. This is what uh, Andrew Haldane called the doom loop. So you have the cycle, and each time the state gets ho get, is hostage, because each time the stakes get higher, and the uh, repercussions of not being able to intervene and not being able to buttress the system become even more frightening. So. It is, uh, so um, again, and this goes back to, to, what, to what Paolo is also saying, the state does not have complete control. It's not tamed the markets. It's in many senses host to the market, but it has been in this, it has, um, I mean, monetary policy is, a way, is, is, is the process of dealing with new situations and trying to negotiate uncharted waters, whether it's through unconventional monetary policy or negative interest rates. Right. So, right now is after the crisis is a critical uh, juncture, and um, and part of the the I mean, uh, oh, what we are again, as Paul also pointed to, at a point where we are we are still in a in an effective dollar standard, uh, but it, the dangers. Um, of the standard are becoming more and more evident, but equally, it's uh, it's quite evident that that I mean that the, we are seeing the difficulties of alternative currencies in, ch in challenging the dollar standard. On one hand, uh, for the eurozone, uh, you don't have a compar comparable market for public debt, which enjoys the monetary backing of the ECB. So, in that sense, it's uh, the there, there's a critical weakness. Uh, there. And China, too, has been going through the steady period of uh, 
international, internationalizing it's the renminbi but the travails has been facing the fact that it's not um, uh, which are also demonstrative of the limits of the state's ability to contain finance, are, all, uh, are also suggesting that uh, setting being an alternative is not going to be easy. It set up the architecture, it's, but now it face, faces, I mean, the architecture includes, um, you know, uh, uh, all, I mean, uh, uh, potential alternatives to financing from the IMF or the World Bank. It includes the infrastructure bank. It includes setting up an international payment system, which is an alternative to the SWIFT. Um, it has uh, set up swap lines with central banks, a uh, large number of central banks, and yet it cannot, as it's facing this uh, continuous um, outflow of capital and the erosion of its huge reserve base, uh, uh, with the uh, as a consequence of the graduated opening up of its capital account, it once again il illustrates fairly dramatically this the link between money power and uh, capitalism and imperialism and in some senses we are at a juncture where uh, it's important to understand what's, ha what's, what's happening and how they play in together and what I presented is that it's in a sense a, uh, a kind of a preliminary foray into untangling some of these issues. Thank you. So, uh, as is tradition, uh, we're going to go ahead and open up the floor for some Q&A. Um, I will try to uh, take questions in the order they come, so uh, raise your hand if you have a question. In your analysis of our mind the capitalist system, uh, do you take into account prices and preferences? and the function, you know, that the money holder can make a choice between different alternative goods and services. Um, and then this case, the money is purely a medium, it's not a liquidity type. The, 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 key, the key behavior that you could call preferences really relates to portfolio and the willingness of interest to hold <clears throat> wealth, in particular monetary forms, that will constrain. Um, the ability of the credit system to respond to demand for credit and will constrain the ability of a central bank to accommodate demand for reserves. Um, that's all that I need to engage with at this level. Yeah, well, I was looking at the level of the participant, not at the level of the federal uh, central bank system. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, Clearly, when you're talking monetary systems, you are talking, you need to have a theory of, of the value of money. You need to have an understanding of what are the t determinations, and this is going to throw you into the real economy very, very quickly. But all that I'm engaging in in this particular line of work is, is with the logical constitution of overcredit monetary form. And for that, the only thing that we need to grapple with is the ability of agents not to hold your liabilities as a store of wealth. To the extent that they can do that, you be constrained. But in the value of money and the line and, and the goods, let's say, take a practical case to the Venezuela, for instance, mm -hmm. right? The, the Bolivar official rate is six and a half to the dollar. Sure. But the market rate is almost a thousand yeah. dollars to the dollar. So no matter what the states print money, mm -hmm. it has no value. So uh, the value of the money is purely. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Um, the, the, the bottom line here is that a credit monetary system functions on the basis of being managed actively by a central monetary authority, yeah. and that it can clearly mismanage it, um, as is the case in Venezuela, as was the case in Zimbabwe, as it was the case when I was growing up in Brazil in the 1980s. Um, so, yes, I mean, there, there, there are very much limits. Um, to what a state can get away with. But what I'm more in, one of the things that is interesting about the current situation is that the U.S. state appears uh, capable of emitting um, uh, seemingly without limits. That, it's, it's that kind of issue that I'm more interested in trying to understand. Be because I think monetary mismanagement is pretty well understood. Uh, there are other people with questions. Mm -hmm. um, about uh, US and, uh, um, yeah. Um, I have a question about 
so this concept that uh, uh, countries all over the world are holding dollars in their reserves in uh, increasing amounts, um, and I think the Willie Sellers uh, research is about how that has been very important. Uh, and so that now we don't have as many currency crises happening as often because of these big reserves. And that's so that a lot of countries, more countries are probably working very hard to build up these big dollar reserves in their central banks. Which is a concept I can't really grasp. What does that even mean? Like, How can all the countries of the world build up a uh, huge dollar reserves in central banks? When some have more, does that mean others have, have, have smaller reserves? Or, or that is a great, how can you explain? So it's uh, the build, uh, the buildup of dollar reserves kind of increased in particular after the Asian crisis in '97 because the entire experience of the Asian crisis uh, was so humiliating <laughs> and pernicious that a lot of country. I mean, that this notion that we are, uh, I mean, we are opening up our capital account, but at least let's have uh, dollar reserves uh, as a hedge. Uh, kind of uh, uh, basically took off after that, and of course, different con different countries have uh, uh, different levels and different abilities to accumulate the dollar reserves. Because you, you can do it either through a trade surplus or by borrowing, right? And and this, in a sense, is what's uh, kind of uh, where China and, and U.S. were kind of. Um, entwined together what some has called the balance of financial terror because and, and that's what China has been kind of struggling to get out of uh, ever since the uh, in particular after the co co collapse of Lehman in 2008 so it's I mean and, and that's the key as long as countries are I mean the central banks perceive uh, the need for this uh, cushion and they think and they, tr and they consider the dollar, the US Treasury bill or dollars as the kind of safety wall, or the, I mean the, the safety net. Mm -hmm. uh, they are going to continue to, I mean, uh, they will attempt to build up these reserves. But, but and the alternative is to kind of have capital controls, which, yeah. Uh, but, but, but the offsetting deficit to that accumulation is happening here. These are mm -hmm. liabilities of, of, yeah. of the, either the federal government or the, or the um, the Federal Reserve, and what's, I mean, I'm going to be a little bit provocative, but I sometimes find myself thinking that the United States is the lead exporter of money, because there appears to be this insatiable demand for holding dollar-denominated claims on the Treasury um, and, and on, on, on the Federal Reserve. Um, the thing to take a step, the significance of these reserve holdings, uh, to my mind, and I think uh, Rama will, will by and large um, uh, agree, since so we, we've, we've talked about this, is this. The reason that a lot of these central banks have had to engage in reserve uh, <coughs> accumulation is because of the very onerous risks posed by financial integration and by the opening up of capital accounts. And, uh, <coughs> to ensure themselves against the horrible choices that are, have been imposed at times of distress, they have accumulated these um, reserves. Sub-Saharan Africa, Denny Roderick had this estimate, were accumulated approximately $200 billion in reserves. And the perverse thing about this is here you have sovereigns who are accumulating assets that are yielding in the neighborhood of 1% and 2%. And when they borrow in the open market, they're paying 12, 13, 14%. You have, in effect, a subsidy of the dollar zone on the basis of, of the losses of these central banks. And that's perverse. And from the standpoint of international development, so, so we're supposed to be moving wealth in the other direction. And what do countries get in exchange for that? The ability to trade and be financially integrated with the rest of the world. How's that going? Um, so this question of an alternative <coughs> system of international reserves is actually very, very important uh, from the standpoint of, of belated development and how we can actually think of ways in which there can be meaningful catching up uh, by a lot of these economies. Rama called this a tribute, a monetary tribute to, mm -hmm. the, to the US dollar. Um, I, since we're uh, starting to run out of time, um, I think we're going to take a round of, of questions. Uh, so I saw Oriel's hand, I uh, saw Sanjay's hand, um, Eugene's hand. Um, okay, um, actually, I want to ask the reverse question uh, to Eva. Because what you see now, actually, like in 2015, like, uh, China has put, like, I think, $500 billion of its own reserves into the market. And you have like Russia and Saudi Arabia, they all prices. 
are on all the reserves there, and like, they are like plummeting totally. And he was like, reading some authors that were talking about the effect of the end of the petrology. But I know that he was on like that much, but for example, Prabhat Panay was talking about like the war on Iraq and in order to sustain the regime. So in some way, like this has been going on for 30 years, like this petrol regime. Like so, what is the next step? How do you see like this? Now is the moment, as you were saying, that the um, people do not want to hold uh, the dollar liabilities anymore. So what is the future for that? Okay. Thank you. Well, fantastic comments. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask whether you could discuss a bit more the relationship between the structural and the contingent in your respective theorizing of, of the issue. Because it seemed to me that in both of your cases, you were offering, in some sense, a structural account of many things that we might otherwise think of as contingent. Certain financial innovations, shadow banking, bailouts of institutions that are too, seemingly too big to fail, and so on, all of which have structural logic in your respective views. At the same time, it looks as if there might be a few things that are not fully explained by that. Rama, you mentioned, for instance, the Argentine bond uh, issue. And I asked Mike Cohen, who is in this institution, works with Argentina the other day, uh, why the vulture funds claims vis-a-vis -vis Argentina have come to the forefront only recently. There have been um, umpteen debt crises in history uh, over the last century and more where vulture funds were not on, at the table. And we have the same basic legal structure of claims and counterclaims. And his answer was, may or may not be a good answer, but his answer was nobody had thought of it. So the vulture funds suddenly came onto the scene and realized, oh, we can make a very elementary argument in law that pacta sunt servanda law, law uh, contracts must be enforced. And here they found a pliable judge, Grisa, who would agree to that, right? Notwithstanding the fact that every other debt crisis in history has found some type, type of accommodation until now. So um, where, what is the role of contingency in your accounts? Yeah, my question is for uh, Professor Dr. Um I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on your notion of monetary underdevelopment. Um, I think you touched on it a little bit in your last answer in terms of the problem, say, of, of African countries and so forth. But how would you reconcile the notion of monetary underdevelopment at a global systemic level with the critique that, for example, certain world systems theorists might have of financialization as kind of an excrescence on global economic activity? How, how, how might we reconcile those two concepts? Um, we'll have time for another round, uh, so I guess we can um, open it to... Uh, when did you go first? <laughs> <laughs> that was buying time here. Um, I, I, I don't know what to say in relation to, to petrodollars right now. Um, but, well, we will know that, that people are divesting themselves of, of dollar reserves and, and dollar positions uh, by the developments on the yield on, on the T-bill. And so far, so good. We're still at... Ten, what, 2% on the 10 year, it's not doing a whole hell of a lot. You can still get a mortgage at 3.7% on 30 years fixed, which is a remarkable thing given where we are um, in the world and in the cycle. Sanjay's question is very difficult and it's actually very much, it informs how I've tried to think about this because what I am trying to get at is, if you will, the organizing principle that gives you what the long-term outcome of this evolutionary process is. But as with all such processes, there is a lot of contingency um, um, along the way. Um, what I'm trying to simply to propose is that um, if there is a profit to be made by giving capitalism monetary forms that are superior to the hitherto monetary forms, eventually those will be thrown up. And, but they will throw up crises, and they will throw up new questions. And we have had episodes where people have grappled with these various questions. Now, how these get thrown up is completely um, contingent, and usually involves wars and ends of empires. Uh, Vietnam, uh, World War I, the war against France. Big, great big discontinuities mark the shifts between these international monetary regimes. Um, and, and I will be the first one to admit that it would be wrong to try and go all teleological on this and suppose that we are marching towards a particular quote-unquote solution um, uh, in many ways. 
what we're seeing in the way in which the Euro project has um, gone about attempting to resolve this, this, this issue. We have seen a retrogression to a gold standard-like uh, uh, setup of rigidities and really regressive uh, processes of adjustment to balance of payments uh, um, uh, problems. And last but not least, uh, on the other question, um, that's a very good question as well, and, and, and I have a thought, I have a line of, of argumentation with this. I think it, that we need to appreciate that the scopes for the, what's the word I'm looking for? Overgrowth of finance in the dollar zone the, and the associated financial hypertrophy, if you will, in the U.S. economy is very much supported by the standing of the dollar in the international uh, monetary system. If the dollar, if there weren't the demand for dollar as reserves as you have now, you wouldn't have the ability of an economy to sustain. Um, the, the levels of, of financial activity that the U.S. economy sustains. But then at the same time, and this is the mo most interesting thing we were talking about this the other day, it is entirely possible, too, that the position of the United States as, a, as an international reserve currency today is also then in turn supported by the fact that you have the deepest and most liquid financial markets in the world in the dollar zone. If you are a quantum of capital value looking for an investment opportunity and you, and you go like a blind monkey throwing darts, right? There's about a 40% chance that your quantum of value is going to land in the dollar zone, right? And that is by an effect of the, so there's an element of self-reinforcement here. So in many ways, we can bring together a critique of the imbalances and iniquities of the form of, forms of financial hypertrophy that we experience in the United States and this form of international monetary underdevelopment where we're relying on the uh, currency of a particular nation state um, to do all of these nice uh, international things for us. Okay, um, we have time for one more round of questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me start with the petrodollar issue. Now, um, um, that's one, it is one aspect of Prabhat Patnak's uh, argument that I don't fully buy is his linking of um, um, the work is the international monetary standard ultimately to, to commodity like like petrol. There's a complicated relationship. I mean, so on one hand, in the um, uh, during the time of the OPEC crisis, you had the U.S. playing a role in kind of ensuring that the that the oil surpluses go through private euro dollar markets and not through uh, uh, the IMF channels as a way of um, you know getting its uh, getting banks like Citibank to play a bigger role uh, in that and in a helping to, helping using that to underwrite the, the role of the dollar so yeah I mean the, those oil surpluses were played a role in uh, the establishment of the flo floating dollar standard but what I mean I think it's better to think of it as you know this pyramid of assets uh, and, and credit and what's happening uh, to the petrol or dollars is just one aspect of, of this whole overarching structure uh, important but not the central <laughs> um, uh, the issue of contingency, of course, I mean, um, there, there is contingency, I mean, uh, even in the ways um, central banks learn how to deal with uh, what's happening in the financial markets, there's an there's aspect of contingency and um, the point about the Argentinian um, um, Debt was that uh, it was my, it was it was after that that collective action clauses were included, which uh, which would not allow a similar kind of claim to be made, for example, in Greece, okay, where the court of the Greek uh, 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 arrangements with with the bondholders. So yeah, I mean, of course, there's an element. I mean, what 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 structure does is gives gives you a framework within which to see how patterns or, or let's say the broad contours in which the evolutions are being propelled. So I find, I mean, it's, it's more to frame and uh, history is full of contingency. And uh, uh, in some senses, I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, Paolo about that the big shifts will happen because of you know, something um, I mean, could, could be sparked off by contingent events too. 
Um, what's the anything else? Uh, yeah, on, uh, I mean, the question wasn't for me, but I would like to say something about this uh, monetary underdevelopment because uh, in a way it's, um, I mean, it goes back to another question that I asked about why, why are people keeping dollars, I mean, holding dollar liabilities? I mean, the fact of the fragility or the underdevelopment of financial markets, which are being integrated into in this, uh, uh, into the network, um, in itself creates a demand for insurance and creates the demand for, you know, holding dollar liabilities. So it feeds it. And monetary underdevelopment is one, ha one aspect of it. And you also have real implications. I mean, the global value chain of production is the other, uh, has its counterpart in the global balances and the dollar standard. So they are real, I mean, there's stuff happening in the real sphere too, which needs to be integrated. Um, so, what I was about to say. <laughs> um, we have time for one more round of questions. Uh, keep the questions short, um, and remember that there's plenty of time during the reception uh, to ask all the questions that you want. Um, so, uh, are there any other questions? No? Okay, then I guess we can, um, we can wrap up. Um, we uh, do have a reception uh, upstairs in the economics department. Um, you are all more than welcome to come. Please come, um, and thank you for attending.